Hey folks, JR, back for another episode of Echoes of Shannon Street Case File. It's going to be episode 68, House Was Secured. Before we get started, folks, don't forget now, hit that subscribe button if you get a chance. I would greatly appreciate it. Also, click on the link down in the description to follow everything Shannon Street. Or if you feel like a little history, just click on the old link for Snowy and Boone. All right, we're going to continue with the follow-up investigation. This is an arduous journey for sure the investigators have to go through. I think it does give you an appreciation for how much work is involved, unlike what you see on TV. All right, well, let's get cranked up here and let's see what uh, they uncover today. The writer first interviewed Dorothy Sanders, female black, 46, 2239 Shannon. She was employed at Seamstress Services. Ms. Sanders advised that she was the wife of Lindbergh Sanders and that she and Lindbergh were the only people that lived at 2239 Shannon. She did state that several young men would come to their home and Lindbergh would teach them the Bible. She stated that Lindbergh had been having some problems and that he had been treated for a mental condition several years ago and he was not taking his medication as I'm assuming that should be, as should as he should be, says as should. She stated that she and Lindbergh had personal problems regarding his religion. And that should be his religious beliefs. And she had left home until they could settle their personal problems. She stated she last saw him on Saturday. But she talked to him on Tuesday, January 11, 1983, between 5 and 6 p.m. She stated that Lindbergh asked her to get his jogging suit out of the cleaners and wanted to know when she was coming home. She was asked if she knew who was in the house, and she stated she was not sure, but she believed that her daughter-in-law, Rose Sanders, was in the house. She stated she believed this because that Rose's grandfather had gotten Rose's baby in front of 2239 Shannon in the early evening of January 11, 1983, and that the grandfather believed that Rose went inside the house. She was asked about some of the names that had been obtained, and she stated the only name familiar were Earl and David, but she did not really associate with the young men that came to listen to Lindbergh preach the Bible. It was also learned during the conversation with Miss Sanders that her sister, Lulu, had told her that her husband, Reginald McRae, had been in the house but left when the police arrived and had gone out the back and jumped over a fence and gotten away. should be noted that Miss Sanders and all other parties who were interviewed during this time were very reluctant to give information and refused to allow the writer to tape the interview. The writer next talked to Linda Sanders, female black, 22, 2239, Shannon, unemployed. She stated she had been out of town for several months and had just returned from New Mexico on January 11, 1983, at 5.20 p.m. She stated she was not aware of exactly what was going on and could provide no further information. The writer then interviewed Albert Thomas, male black, 29, employed at... Nico Chemical Company. Albert is the brother of Earl Thomas, who was believed to be in the house at 2239 Shannon. Albert stated that Earl was about 20 years old, slim build, black complexion, with small amount of hair on his chin. Albert stated he last saw Earl on Friday, and he saw Earl's car at his home. He stated that Earl worked at John Sebastian's bagels on Poplar, and he was usually, and he usually caught the bus at noon to go to work. He stated he had never known Earl to carry a weapon. The writer then interviewed Angie Thomas, female black, 26. She's employed at the IRS on Democrat. She could not provide any more information on Earl other than to say he did frequent Lindbergh's 
and she believed he was in the house. She said that she had seen Reginald McRae's car at his home at 848 speed on Friday morning, and when she went by on Saturday evening, the car was still there. She said that she saw McRae's car this morning, 11183 at 2239 Shannon. Therefore, she knew McRae had been there, but information was he had left when police arrived. The writer then interviewed Jacqueline Jordan, female black, 28, employed at Memphis Pathology Lab at Tillman and Walnut Grove. She stated that she was the wife of David Lee Jordan and that the car, Yellow Continental, parked in front. In front of the school, across from 2239 Shannon, belonged to her and David. She stated that David had picked her up from work at approximately 5.15 p.m. on Tuesday, and they went home and that he had left about 6.30 p.m. going to Lindbergh's. She described David as 29 years old, 5'4", 130, 135 pounds, dark-complected mustache, small chin whiskers, wearing black short sleeve shirt, jeans, and black and white reversible jacket. She stated she did not know any of the events that had happened until someone called her on the phone and told her David's car was in front of 2239 Shannon. She could provide no more information other than David had known Lindbergh for five years. Should be noted that with Mrs. Jordan was a Michael Fuchs, male black 25, employed at J.O. Patterson Funeral Home at Chelsea and Springdale. Michael is the cousin of Mrs. Jordan, and he stated that he had never been to 2239 Shannon, and all he knew was that David had friends that lived at 2239 Shannon. Should be noted that there were several other people in the room, and when the writer asked if anyone had any information that would be helpful, the writer received a negative response. During the same period of time, it was learned that Sergeant Landers and Collier had interviewed several people, and they had a list of names believed to be in the house. Names they had were Michael Coleman, Lindbergh Sanders, Skinny McRae, Juju, Julius Riley, and it looks like Red, and possibly Lindbergh's son, Larnell. It was believed at this point that there were six male blacks, and according to Miss Sanders, a female black in the house with Officer Hester. On January 12, 1983, 11.20 p.m., the writer was informed that the mother of Michael Coleman had arrived at the school. The writer did interview Betty Jean Coleman, female black, unemployed. Miss Coleman stated that she believed her son Michael Delane Coleman, age 18, date of birth 81764, who was six foot tall and 180 pounds, was in the house because she talked to him on the phone Tuesday. She stated she last saw Michael on Monday, 11083, when he came home after attending religious services on Friday. Saturday and Sunday at Lindbergh Sanders' home. Michael had told his mother that the world was going to end and this was the latter days and that she had better get ready. She stated as far as she knew, the religious beliefs of Lindbergh Sanders had no name. Miss Coleman went on to say that on Tuesday, 1-11-83, between 4 and 8 p.m., police officers had come to her home at 6.30 North 7th Apartment A, looking for Michael in regards to a purse snatch. She told them he was not at home, that he was at Berg's, Lindbergh Sanders, and she called Berg's and talked to Michael about the police looking for him. She stated that while she was talking to Michael, she could hear Berg in the background cursing. She stated for some reason Michael hung up, the police left, and she did nothing more until... She heard the news about the shooting. Mrs. Coleman further related that she had two other sons, Benjamin, age 24, and Timothy, age 19, who had been to Lindbergh's home for religious services. She stated that she knew something, and I can't read it. Benjamin nor Timothy were in the house, but she knew Michael was. On January 13, 1983, in the early morning hours, 
we were advised that the decision had been made for the TAC unit to make an assault on the house in an attempt to free Officer Hester. At approximately 3.04 a.m., the shoot team and violent crimes officers met in the cafeteria of the school, and it was decided that after the TAC unit assaulted the house and got Hester out, we would work together on the investigation. It was decided that should Officer Hester be fatally injured, then the investigation from that point would be handled by violent crimes. In the event that Officer Hester was still alive, the investigation would be handled by the shoot team which is security squad. The TAC unit commenced their assault at approximately 3.42 a.m. TAC officers advised that the house was secured and for investigators to move forward and take control of the scene. By this time, it had been learned that Officer Hester had received fatal injuries and Sergeant J.F. Garner of the Violent Crime Squad was to coordinate the investigation with the shoot team investigators assisting him. The writer had made previous arrangements for the Uniformed Patrol Division to have uniformed officers rope off the entire crime scene area. This was done, and the writer, along with Patrolman D.W. Cooper, maintained the outside area of the crime scene. During the next several hours, numerous officers from violent crimes and the crime scene squad conducted their investigation. Lieutenant H.J. Toussaint assisted in taking photographs, and Sergeant F.R. Hester made a videotape of the inside of the house. Now that Sergeant Hester is no relation to Bobby Hester. During this part of the investigation, the writer had Sergeant T.N. Landers handle the scene at the hospital in regards to Patrolman Hester. The writer had Sergeant B.O. Wheeler, J. Hammers, and J.L. Collier report to the security squad office and begin taking statements of officers from the TAC unit. The writer, along with Lieutenant Toussaint and Patrolman Cooper, remained on the scene at 2239 Shannon to assist if needed. And in this first few words, I cannot read that at all, what that says. Uh, it says, the and then something this point had revealed that during the attack unit assault, seven male blacks had been fatally injured. At this point, the identity of the male blacks was not known, and Dr. Harlan of the medical examiner's office had pronounced all seven dead on the scene. At approximately 7.30 a.m., several medic ambulances arrived to transport the bodies to the morgue. The writer, along with Lieutenant Tucson, assisted in this procedure, which was completed at approximately 8.30 a.m. On January 13, 1983, the writer checked with Lieutenant Rick Wilson of the violent crimes as to whether shoot team personnel could be of further assistance. It was decided at that point that there was sufficient violent crimes investigators on the scene, so the shoot team investigators reported to their office. Upon arriving at security squad office, the writer was advised by other investigators that they had taken tape statements from several officers. Sergeant Bill Wheeler had taped statements from Patrolman J. Filsinger, R.J. Shelton, P.E. Long, J.D. Bland, and R.O. Watson. Sergeant J. Hammers had taped statements from Patrolman H.L. Bug, D.A. Rutherford, and D.C. Hubbard. Sergeant Collier had taken taped statements from Patrolman K.K. McNair, P.L. Hale, and C.R. Summers. These statements were all later reduced to writing or part of this file. January 13, 1983, at approximately 12 noon, the writer was advised that the security squad shoot team would complete the investigation for the writer to return to 2239 Shannon. All right, folks, that's going to wrap up this episode. Look, just as an added feature here, I thought I would uh, identify some of these pictures that are in that uh, collage. I'm going to Put a red block around it, red square. The one for today's episode, Mark 1998, that's a picture of myself and some other officers, I'm sorry, sergeants from the gang unit. We were pulling marijuana from a grow out in some woods off of 3rd Street. The 
thing that makes that picture auspicious is not that we were pulling marijuana and made the news. It was a few hours later, we would make the news in a more negative way. And when it was all said and done, after an arrest, a narcotics arrest, I got uh, suspended for 40 working days. That's two months. I'm not going to go into the story. It's too long and arduous of a story to tell. But it's a good story, I'll tell you. It's a good one. Anyways, just I'll give you a little tidbit there, and I'm going to go through each of the pictures, and we'll talk about them just for a second or two. All right, that's all I want to say about that that year. That was not a, a good few months. All right, folks, I've enjoyed our little episode today. We will get back together in a few days and continue this investigation. That uh, picture of Lieutenant Toussaint from Security Squad, he later was my major on the midnight shift at South Precinct. And then he rose to the rank of chief. He was a good, he was a pretty good major. He was a really good chief. He's really sharp. Really, really sharp guy. All right, folks, enough of all that. I do appreciate y'all tuning in. And as always, I will see you down the road.